know, it changes daily, really. What are you saying? Quite a number of us in Southside Village should have our hair tested. If you live in the lower part, I would. Um, the upper part, I mean, that would be a personal. If it were me, people have asked, if it were me living up the hill, I would not be as concerned if I was further up the hill. But I know the, I know the springs at the bottom of Southside Village are contaminated. I've sampled those. Well, some houses down low have been sampled and they were okay, but that would go by EPA. And they can't do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's a one time sample. I mean, the, if you go to any of the, Barry went through a vapor intrusion um, summit, and you know, they say you should be careful about the sample size. Yeah. Well, they have to repeat it several times. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Pollution is the solution to pollution. I mean, that's what we have to thank EPA. That's a, in all fairness, that is a very common, if you've ever gone by a site and you're like, I wonder why no one's living here, or there's no business here, and you see a little trailer with a, with a PVC pipe, that's what's happening. They're pumping it out through the little stack. That's very common. Yeah. I, I just wanted to make a statement that as far as how it got into some of the streams, my husband's aunt actually poured the barrels out into the creek. And he talked about how she would come out to work with her hands blue. And she's dead now. She got a nervous, it affected her nervous system and she died. Very young. If any, if any of you have information, this is one of the things that's been very challenging. If you have any information about people who worked at the plant, like Mary Sue, who worked there for 30 years, uh, and they knew something was going on, someone was asking about the duration of exposure, and, and they, were, they had a containment pond with 100,000 gallons was unlined. They had a hidden culvert piping system to deliver it there. They had a, if you go back to the slide with the um, building on it, and that, someone was asking about the back of the plant with the driveway. If you point to the corner of it. Yeah, that's one. Yeah, you see that pipe? That's the corner pipe right there. Right, right, yeah. There's one. That's one end of it. That goes right beside Peter's. That's where they dumped it. And so they had two uh, point source pollution exposure pathways. One went into that pond, which is in Southside Village, which was part of CPS, and the other went into the Rice property. The third way, aside from dumping like that, was when CTS took that plant over from IRC, they reconfigured the building. They didn't use the appropriate materials. The contaminants ate through the acid brick. I mean, there was no acid brick, so it ate through the flooring. It exposed bare soil. So upwards of 25 years, as that waste product is running out, it is going right into the soil right there. And as you might imagine, where do you think they found 830,000 parts per billion in 2001 at boring hole number three at 32 feet. And where would they find it in 2014? The same boring location, 28 feet shallower, it's one million, 120,000 parts per million. So they have multiple ways that they release this. And there's no doubt about that. And uh, our attorneys are here that represented us with the Supreme Court from the Dungan Law Firm, you know, Jeff Stahl and Robert Dungan. And you know, there's no question who the responsible party is. But the saddest part is, is that we're regulators that knew the same thing and didn't do anything about it. So those are the ways that it got into the environment. The amount, there's no telling. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if the CTS and or the EPA were to adopt that treat pump method that you was mm -hmm. saying, does that, does that render it uh, safe? What they're pumping out the oh they pump it out and treat it on site they have like a they build a little like i don't know not a lab but a you know like a, a water treatment facility basically on yeah, site my, my concern is that you know if they pump something out and it's still toxic do we trust cts and the epa to properly dispose of what is pumping out or does this do it I, I will say that pump and treat is used is pump and treat is the most common um treatment mechanism other than natural attenuation and so the technology is very readily available it's not it's not something new or experimental what they're what they'd be doing on the surface is not new or experimental yeah. I'll let you each decide whether you trust the back there now um, as a policy question I'm mystified is that John yeah John Hi. yeah I'm, I'm mystified that CTS still has Control over the property to the extent where they can tell EPA where to drill. I, well, what's what's? I'm not. I, I don't. I, I don't want to wade into the policy, but I don't quite understand either. Because every time, even with the vapor testing and the rices, they said, "Well, we'll go ask CTS if they will do that." Yeah. And CTS says, "Well, your guidance says we don't need to, so we're not going to pay for it." And they said, "Well, CTS won't pay for it." It's like. It's I don't understand. So everything, and even now, it was in the news, um, I believe yesterday or the day before, um, where Samantha said, well, we'll have to go to CTS and negotiate with them. I don't understand. Uh, some of you are, you know, politicians, uh, maybe 
You can work on that. <laughs> Congressman. <laughs> okay. I'm getting the um, wrapping up check. Let your wife ask a question real quick. Okay. <laughs> so my question goes maybe to take. Uh, the question is like we've been meeting for over maybe five or six years, but I'm so happy that I have seen so many people tonight. Like I'm impressed. But my question is, what can we do as a community, strong, all together, to help you get this clean up? The question is, what can we do as a community? There's so many people here tonight. What can we do as a community? Yes. Well, the most important thing is to have a turnout like this and then create alliances. Uh, Charles Thomas had been heavily involved in 2007, 2008 as a legislator, uh, continued his work. And uh, clearly there have been different things that simply take us in and out of this. Some of us have had, for whatever reason, the compulsion to stay with it from start to finish. But even then, we have to back out from time to time and get back involved. If you have more people that are available, then you have more people that are constantly involved. Uh, how many people received a robocall tonight? Okay, so 40,000 calls goes out, and the next thing you know, we have a meeting like this. But then again, a story goes into the newspaper, uh, press release is given by the Environmental Protection Agency claiming there are new things that are happening and there's a lot of fear. And fear is a very powerful device that can turn a lot of people out. What we're hoping through what Dr. Wilcox just did and what we're going to talk about in terms of moving forward is that you can counter that fear with truth and with facts and you can apply that in just about any part of your life. But in this case, we've been trying to speak science. We felt like with Barry and others that we were fairly eloquent with that, but we aren't scientists. Now we have a PhD who's been on this for six years with his students and others. And so as we have been talking science, they have been talking fiction. And we are at a place now where we have to have a unified way stepping forward so that we're comfortable with the options that we do have because we do have options. And so one of the things we want to talk to you tonight about uh, in terms of the agenda is moving forward. So uh, I think it is about putting yourself in other people's shoes. Uh, Dot Rice has always said it's bigger than her family, and it is. Aaron Penland's here and it wiped his family out. There are so many people that have someone that they know that worked there that are dead or sick and dying. So that's what this is about. You don't have to be sick to help someone that has been sick. It is the precautionary principle. We should be acting today with regard for tomorrow. So. Uh, Oh, I just wanted to say, I, I, I'm getting the hook, but I wanted to say thank you for your attention. Um, I, I sort of sat in the wings for a long time, listening to everything and, you know, kind of reading. This is the first time that I've given this type of a presentation, but I'm willing to do it again, and I really appreciate your attention. I tried to make a little bit of, what, you know, light with the jokes, but it is a very serious thing, and I think that, you know, I looked at it, Either, um, either the numbers are there and this is a hazard and it needs to be cleaned up, or the, you know, the numbers are not there and we need to stop complaining about it. And I think based on the actions on Friday, you know which one it is. It's that, it, that there is something here that needs to be cleaned up and um, I think the numbers show that. And so the main thing is getting those numbers into the summary reports. You know, Dean Apple is not present and we need to understand that not everything you read in the summary report is accurate, and we need to check everything. I, maybe we can do something about it. The last thing I'll say is on the bottom of the little cheat sheets I gave you is my contact information. If you have questions, um, please feel free to email. Um, that's my office phone number, too. We're uh, going to uh, give the mic to Jerry Ensminger and let him talk about Camp Lejeune and its relationship to CTS and the litigation. So, uh, Mr. Jerry Ensminger, he's been working on the Camp Lejeune site for 17 years. Uh, he lost his daughter, Jamie, to childhood leukemia and has uh, worked without end and continues to work. So, uh, it's a great honor to introduce Jerry Ensminger. Thank you so much for being here.
Lejeune is probably known as the largest and worst contamination of a public drinking water system in the history of our nation. My daughter Janie was the only one of my four children to have been conceived, carried or born while we lived at Camp Lejeune during the contamination period, which ATSDR now puts from 1953 to 1987. The estimates are between 750,000 and over a million people were exposed. The health effects of TC, which is trichloroethylene, are kidney cancer, liver cancer, bladder cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, leukemia, and multiple kidney and liver diseases, and also Parkinson's-like diseases. Birth defects, neural tube defects, which are babies born without a brain, were born with a partial brain, <coughs> babies born without a cranium, uh, oral clefts, or the lip, or the palate. At Camp Lejeune, we had a cocktail. We had PCE, TCE, DCE vinyl chloride, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene, methylene chloride in our water. <coughs> this is no joke. Uh, I just drove up today from Atlanta where we had a meeting about Camp Lejeune for the last, well, I've spent most of the week down there uh, at the CDC. Uh, we had meetings about Camp Lejeune and where we're going with Camp Lejeune as far as studies in the future. And one of our experts, who is Dr. Ken Cantor, who was the former head researcher for the National Cancer Institute, uh, he sits on our panel. He also sits on the National Toxicology Program Board. Monday, our National Toxicology Program issued their draft report on TCE. Finally, the EPA <coughs> reclassified TCE as a known human carcinogen on the 28th of September 2011. The NTP issued their assessment draft assessment Monday. It is a class one human carcinogen. Now, Dr. Wilcox left something off of his presentation. PCE, yes, is four chlorine molecule. TCE, which is tri, tri means three. It's three chlorine molecule. When it loses another chlorine molecule, it becomes DCE dichloroethylene. And it goes through a couple phases in the dichloroethylene phase. <coughs> and then it becomes vinyl chloride. And vinyl chloride will kill you in a minute. It is highly carcinogenic. And that is the breakdown of this stuff in the phases that it goes through. I don't know how many of you seen the documentary that was made about Camp Lejeune, but if you haven't, you might want to watch it. Because they followed and went to meetings, and they listened to people that were exposed to these very same contaminants. Now, I heard some questions about EPA, and why have they done this, and why have they done that. Let me tell you something. In my 17 years of fighting for justice for Camp Lejeune, I have become very, very familiar with on Capitol Hill. Uh, I made very good friends with the 
former general counsel for the Energy and Commerce Committee, environmental section, EPA Region 4 is the most industry friendly EPA region in our nation. That's not speculation. That's based on the, the numbers of actions that EPA Region 4 takes against industry within their region. And they hardly take any. We have a federal facilities manager from EPA Region 4 that's supposed to be overseeing Camp Lejeune. And she's worthless. She's you. Now, you all heard about the Supreme Court ruling Monday, but there have been some steps taken in the North Carolina legislature, uh, and some good news came out today, and we have a gentleman in the audience here that I would like to come up and allow him to read what the North Carolina legislature is doing. Thank you. I didn't know that I was going to do this, so forgive me. No. I'm Charles Thomas. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, this morning, the North Carolina General Assembly uh, used a procedure that's often used at this part of the year. Uh, without going into too much inside baseball, uh, new bills can't be filed during this time of the year. Uh, but what you can do, and it's done just to, to funnel the whole um, the whole total number of bills that they have to deal with down there down to a smaller number. Uh, but what you do is you take a bill that has already passed one chamber that's no longer needed, so it becomes a vehicle or an envelope, and then that vehicle is still allowed under the rules to move forward as a new bill. Happens all the time. So what they did is they took Senate Bill 574 that was in the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, early this morning, about 845, they referred it uh, to Judiciary Subcommittee B. And in that committee, they stripped out all the language that was in it because it wasn't needed anymore. And they put in language that essentially told the Supreme Court, told the change the statute in North Carolina that says the General Assembly finds that the Supreme Court's decision is inconsistent with the legislature's intentions and the legislature's understanding of federal law at the time that certain actions were filed. So the long and short of it is, is that tomorrow morning, in agreement uh, with the Republican leadership and the Democrat leadership, they have both agreed already that tomorrow the bill will be read in on the floor of the House. It will not be objected to. Um, it's already posted on the calendar. Uh, and it's going to pass the House probably unanimously. Uh, come Monday, it'll be read in in the Senate. And I'd be surprised if it didn't pass there unanimously. And I would also suspect then that by the end of the day, on Monday, uh, Governor McCrory should have signed that bill. Uh, so that will, the lawyers can speak to the language of it, whether or not, you know, it will have any impact on any of your situations. Um, but they, they took a pretty big step to say today um, to the Supreme Court that, you know, we're, we're not going to be part of this, this problem anymore. Um, if the federal government's going to try and mess it up, or even the state agencies are going to mess it up, or, or corporations are going to mess it up, uh, they're not going to be part of it. So they've, in my mind, they've, they've, they've cleared the, they cleared the, the deck here uh, so that uh, these folks can, can do what they, they need to do. So if people have questions about that process, I can answer it, but I'm not an attorney. Well, Oh, and, and also, know that the fact that all of you came out and that they knew that you were coming, um, that, 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 that is part of it. I've been doing this for a long time. Yes, ma'am. In the bottom line, they've removed the 10-year from the state statute. It, it hasn't happened yet, but, but I'm a pretty good handicapper when it comes to which bills will pass and which ones won't. If you were to vote against this bill, I would assume that you were retiring from politics. <laughs> so hope is a good thing, and this is going to give all of you 
and all of us at Camp Lejeune some hope. Uh, you know, I, I have a, a quote that I made up myself, um, and it pertains to contamination and the back and forth that I've been through uh, for all these years when I worked this thing politically. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a registered independent voter. My political door swings both ways. The only reason I'm telling you that is this. Contaminated drinking water, cancer, birth defect, and all of the other health effects that go along with contaminated water are omnipartisan. They have no party affiliation. And they devastate on a nonpartisan basis. They get you all. Doesn't matter what you who or you what you are, what party you follow, what religion you are. If you're a living thing, it's going to get you. Some people slide by and doesn't bother them. Might have something to do how much you drink. <laughs> but Senator Hagan issued a letter today to the EPA, the administrator, and Barry, you're going to read that? Sontag in uh, Senator Hagan's office uh, several days ago, and uh, I'm very gratified to see that uh, this letter's been drafted. Um, and I will say, just at the outset, that I, I probably will have some more discussions uh, with Brian because I think, uh, I mean, uh, Aaron, uh, I think there need to be some adjustments to this letter, and particularly in light of. Uh, what Dr. Wils Wilcox described, what the real problem is, and I suspect that some of these points uh, are from the EPA uh, guidance, and they're talking about the LNAP, all, and of course, Jeff, uh, Dr. Wilcox has been talking about the NAPL, excuse me, the DNAPL, I'm sorry, ah, tongue twister. Uh, but I can go ahead and read this to you, and uh, I should do so. To, and this was addressed to uh, Heather uh, Tony, the regional administrator. I guess they have a new one. I thought it was uh, Stan Weinberg. Um, Dear Administrator Tony, I like to express concern. You know, I'm, I really haven't had any problems reading this. Would you mind reading this for me? I appreciate it. I, I did not bring my glasses. So. Okay. The whole thing? Okay. Dear Administrator Tony, I write to express concern regarding the status of efforts to clean up the toxic chemicals that continue to pose serious public health threats to the community that surrounds the defunct CTS facility on Mills Gap Road in Asheville, North Carolina. As you know, the recent findings of dangerous levels of trichloroethylene in the air resulted in the relocation of multiple families from their homes, creating serious disruption and uncertainty in their lives. This is unfortunately the latest reminder of the significant work that remains to achieve full remediation. To that end, I ask for your expeditious response to the following inquiries. Please provide a detailed timeline of when the air quality tests were performed, when the analysis of the samples was completed, and when the families were notified of the contaminants and relocated from their homes. What actions are underway to remove air toxins in and around these homes? and when will the families be safely able to return home? Are there impediments that prevent EPA from initiating an immediate interim or mandatory removal action to clean up the TCE recently discovered in a mass of light petroleum on the CTS site and dense? If there are no, that was my part. If there are no obstacles, when will EPA initiate this action? It is my understanding that removal of masses of light petroleum routinely occur at non-Superfund sites across the country. If that is accurate, I would strongly encourage EPA to quickly proceed in the same manner. 
What is preventing EPA from addressing the source of the contaminants at the CTS site while simultaneously addressing air or water contamination identified in the surrounding community? Please provide a detailed summary and timeline of EPA's plan to achieve full remediation. This summary should include information about technical, procedural, funding, or any other obstacles that further that factor into achieving this objective. The contaminants at this site have threatened the safety and well-being of this community for far too long. I am committed to working with you in whatever way is necessary to ensure we proceed as quickly as possible to get the affected families back in their homes and ensure a full cleanup of the surrounding area. Thank you, and I look forward to your prompt response. Sincerely, Kay Hagen. One other thing, when Dr. Wilcox was talking about how this stuff travels, and you're talking about a denapple, which is what chlorinated solvents are. At Camp Lejeune, we had incomplete con uh, confining layers. We had layers of clay where these denapples or these chlorinated solvents, DCE, 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 would go down and they hit the clay and they wouldn't go any deeper. So they followed the gradient and all of a sudden these layers of clay discontinued and they dropped off way down. They don't even know how far down they've gone. And they tried that one treatment with the ionized iron shavings and the slurry and and that didn't do it. Uh, what they ended up doing was capping the site with a blackout parking lot. <laughs> and the plume is still moving and it's going toward New River. Uh, and that's where it's going to end up. Uh, with the shrimp. So. Okay. I guess, uh, uh, you know, I should extend upon what my, what my remarks were about uh, Senator Hayden's letter, but uh, one of the things that I said to Aaron Sante, and I, and I, and I brought forth, um, in 2002, they recognized this issue, and that's when they identified the 830,000 parts per billion that Jeff refers to in his, in his, in his presentation. And they executed a document that the federal government has available to them in the event of an imminent endangerment to public health and the environment. And it is probably the most powerful tool that the federal government has that can cut through red tape to address an issue where human life is threatened. And that document was executed in 2002. It is essentially the same, it is the same legislation that, for instance, that uh, EPA and the federal government used when the Gulf oil spill happened. And the EPA moved in their stuff. They didn't have to ask BP for what, you know, their, their, how to operate with their, their, their drilling rig. Uh, they build them later. And that is the document that still is in effect because that document is very clear. It describes the contamination under the building and the effect that it's having on the springs. And uh, the thing was the, 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 doc, the, we, we, the Dr. Webster is the uh, on-scene coordinator who wrote that document back in 2002. He has now been elevated in this division of the agency up to, he, he's what they call the branch chief. He is the top of the full chain for eight states for emergency response. And last Saturday, I wrote a letter to him. Uh, I referenced his own document uh, that he executed. I, re I referenced the statements that he made when he, he came to a public meeting here in 2007. And he basically confirmed that that's what the order was for. It was for the contaminant under the footprint of the building and extending outward toward the springs. And he also said, in that, in that situation, that they can do whatever they need to, uh, including doing the work themselves if need be. And so the point that I made to Aaron Sontag 
and our other representatives in the Burr's office that they need to get back on course for that original action and take the necessary action to uh, to do the work themselves or force CPS to do it and get to that DNAPL. So DNAPL is the largest, biggest threat here because it's the DNAPL that will migrate. It's the DNAPL that carries the highest concentration of TCE. And the other thing that's not recognized here is because of the fractured bedrock here, you literally can, if you have TCE in a bulk situation, you have identified its location, uh, that's the only time you can really clean it. But in the fracture bedrock system, you can actually have the TCE travel down a fracture of the fissure and find a new shelf someplace else and create localized groundwater contamination. And what's unique about this site is the contaminant is at the top of a hill. So it has potential energy. I don't think Camp Lejeune is at the top of a hill. And so the point I've made, and I think it's an apt one, is that what we have here is the comparison of a uh, overturned tanker truck at the top of the hill that's slow leaking its contaminant in, into the, uh, the groundwater in the soil, and it is an emergency. It warrants an emergency action. It warrants quick action. The EPA's talked about getting to this in 2018. They need to get on this as soon as possible, and they can do it under that order. So I think someone asked, what can the community do uh, at this point that can really be a hammer that, the, that our representatives, including Senator Hagan, can get the